few weeks ago, we heard of the works of Kids Hope from Alan and Lee Hindmarsh. Kids Hope is a school-based mentoring program for children experiencing vulnerability. Since 2004, Kids Hope has impacted thousands of children who, through care and support, have seen their lives transformed and now experience increased confidence and resilience. It seems that Alan and Lee Hindmarsh have been doing this work for some time and today I'd like to call Alan and Lee to come forward, please. This certificate is a certificate of recognition and presented to the Columbia United Church and Columbia State School through Alan and Lee Hindmarsh. So Alan and Lee, I'd like you to, to accept this and I believe there is a copy of this on the, on the wall so anybody and, and information about why it was given and um, I think they've done a wonderful job working for over 15 years. Well done, congratulations. And that's it from me. Thank you, everybody, and have a good week. Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Um, it's Father's Day, and uh, Indy woke up very happy this morning. To, she loves giving gifts. That's why she's at the back giving things out this morning. So I hope you uh, enjoyed the chocolate, and hopefully you can read the, uh, the words on that little bookmark. It's a bit challenging after I printed them. I realised uh, my eyes are a bit younger. <laughs> I'll be able to read it a bit easier. But uh, let's join together in our call to worship this morning. Come to God who gathers us in. Come to God whose arms are open and waiting. Come to God who journeys with us. Come, let us praise our loving and nurturing God. Amen. Shall we pray? From all our life's parts, you have called us to this place this morning, O Lord. Be with us as we listen for your word and seek for your ways. Guide our steps and guard our lives that we may serve you more effectively in this broken world today. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is based on Psalm 95 and the vibrancy of the music and the words of praise come together as we sing this song of worship to our Lord. Let's join together as we sing.
be with us this day. We have at times faltered in service of you. We sometimes create divisions between various people. We judge before we listen. We condemn before we make attempts to understand. We live lives that are often in turmoil and we confess that we have often turned away from you. It is fear and anger that often surrounds us and our actions become based on those fears and on that anger. Slow us down, Lord. Give us hearts of grace and compassion. Help us to mirror Jesus, who loved and who healed others who were rejected by the polite society. <clears throat> Remind us that we are called to be strong voices of hope for those who feel alienated and lost. We are called to be a home to strangers, to quench the thirst and to give nourishment, to welcome and to bring words of hope. Forgive us when we have forgotten these things, O oh Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Christ calls for each of us in to live our lives of service and hope, and he equips us within these ministries and places us on pathways of peace. And so we rejoice through Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Well, this morning I've got a, uh, a kid's spot that is uh, not from the readings that we have this week, but because I was at Unity College for the Father's Day liturgy, and I thought, well, work smart and hard, uh, and use the verses that that came from. So whilst I was there, they had the prodigal uh, son was the parable that they had as their uh, liturgy, uh, lectionary, well, liturgy readings for them. Um, and do we know the story of the prodigal son? You don't have to come up to it, but I'll show you from here. Um, you can come further forward if you like, though. But uh, the prodigal son is where there's a, a, a child who says to his, his, his dad that I want to have my money now. I don't want to wait for you to die. I want to go and live life and have fun. I want my inheritance. I want it now. And so the father gives his son the inheritance and off he goes and he spends it on parties and drinking and lots of fun things. If it was today, maybe on iPhones or jet skis or something fun like that, he went off and spent lots and lots and lots of money. And then once all the money had gone, he had nothing left and he thought to himself, I really need to go and find a way to eat food. He was starving hungry. So he went to work with pigs and he fed pigs and he was so hungry that he took the pig's food and he ate the pig's food himself. And in that moment, he thought, gosh, I've got to the lowest point possible. And he realised that his servants at his dad's house were being fed and treated better than the pigs were being treated on this farm. And so he decided to go back and he thought that when he got back that his dad would treat him poorly and he would have to be a servant in his dad's house. But when he got there, his dad welcomed him back and said, you are my son and you will always be my son and all things will be forgiven. So I've got a couple of things here that kind of represent that love that God gave us. There's a bottle of clear, it's another science experiment. <laughs> try and get my, uh, my numbers up. So but these... Water, we'll see, we'll see. It's not water, this one. So this is, this is God's love, and this is, represents God's love for us. And these little white things here represent our sin or our mistakes or the things that we've done wrong in our life. And whenever we come to God and we come to Him and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've been doing, then He takes away these sins and they just dissolve, they just disappear. It's, it's working for us. So no matter, how, no matter how many things go wrong in our life, God just keeps taking them away. And we can come back, and we can come back, and we can say thanks to God for those things. But it's not just about saying, oh, well, I know God's going to take those sins away. If I do the wrong thing, I can just come back. It's about trying to ask God for wisdom to live our lives in a better way. And so as we keep going through our life, and we do things, we can come back to God, and hopefully the wiser we get and the more understanding we become of God's love, the less we might have to come for forgiveness. But what we need to remember is that always, when things go wrong in our life, when we do things that aren't of God, we can come to God for that forgiveness. And so hopefully we as fathers try and emulate that with God as well. Uh, we can try and be forgiving and peaceful and kind, and open to our children as we work in that space. So kids, as you go to your Christian learning this morning, try and remember that when we come to God for forgiveness, that God will always accept us and always take us as we are. As God has blessed us uh, in our lives abundantly with love and with gifts, 
let us bring our tithes and our offerings this morning. Those of you who have already given throughout the week, we are thankful for your giving. Those who want to share this morning, we welcome your offerings now. We thank you for their gifts and their tithes and their willingness to serve you. Lord, we pray that these gifts will be given in your name, that you will expand them and that you will use them for your work here in Calandria. Amen. Amen. The Father's love for us. And as we sing together, we're reminded of God's grace and the filling that we have when we reside in his love for us. Let's sing together. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. When I consider the last few years, um, it has at time felt somewhat apocalyptic when we consider the world around us. A worldwide pandemic, wildfires, floods, wars, poverty, part of me flinches when, uh, a little bit, when reading the gospel for this week. It's not easy to think about suffering and loss, about denying ourselves and taking up our crosses, about losing lives in order to save them in such times of challenge and turbulence. Sometimes it's much easier to look back at the scriptures that soothe us rather than challenge, come to me all who are weary, or he leads me beside still waters, or peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. However, in response to this gospel this week, we cannot pivot this way. It's a point that Peter makes and regrets. Somehow, even during the painful, frightening days we might find ourselves in, Jesus' bad news is indeed the good news. As Matthew describes the scene, Jesus has just praised and blessed Peter, as we heard last week, for recognising him as the Messiah. Now Jesus begins to show his disciples that the Messiah must undergo great sufferings at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and ultimately to be killed and on the third day to rise. Standing on our side of the resurrection story, we can't easily imagine the effects these words must have had on Jesus' disciples that day. After all, we are worshipping here in front of the cross. Some people cross themselves without even thinking of it on a daily basis. Many people wear a cross around their neck and it's part of our liturgical vestments. But what happens when we, when this, we shake away from the familiarity of the cross for a few moments? What if we were to listen to Jesus' words as his first disciples listened and heard them 2,000 or so years ago? The disciples' great hope, cultivated over three years of faithfully following Jesus, was that he would lead them in a military revolution and overthrow the Roman oppressors. They had seen his miracles, they had witnessed firsthand his charismatic ability to draw a crowd and to get them on his side. They had heard him proclaim aloud the arrival of the new kingdom. He was their longed for future, their long awaited dream. He was their chance of liberation. So what could be more disorientating, would, uh, what could be more ludicrous than the news that their would-be saviour was sharing with them, determining that he would walk straight into the hands of those who were over them, straight into a death trap. To give himself over not only to severe physical pain, but humiliation and disgrace, to surrender without a fight to a common criminal's death. You know the rest of the story. We hear it year after year. 
But Peter was eager and clueless as ever. He scolds Jesus for his disturbing prediction. And Jesus, in what might be the sharpest and most surprising rebuke in all of Scripture, puts Peter well and truly in his place in that moment with a soft, uh, with a swift and powerful blow. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on the divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus turns to the crowd and captures the essence of his gospel message in two sentences. If any of you become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. I don't know about you, but I can relate to Peter's unease about this hard and challenging teaching, teaching too well. Even now, centuries removed from the context in which Jesus lived and taught, we kind of wince as we consider the implications of this statement for our lives. What exactly is he saying to his followers? What is he saying to us? That he wants us to pursue suffering and death? That the holy life is not living at all, but is indeed dying. Our temptation, as I read this passage, is to minimise what it asks for. Of course, I'll deny myself in certain things uh, in my life for a few months. I'll pray more, I'll study more, I'll volunteer more, I'll come to church every week. I might be in trouble if I didn't do that one. <laughs> but I think... However, all good things and worthy things, I'm sure, but not perhaps what Jesus had in mind when he invited the crowds to lose their lives for the sake of the gospel. Not what he rebuked in the strongest way possible, Peter, to avoid. Jesus' cross is not a cosy shortcut for us. We also try the other way. We attempted to maximise in the other direction, to become, as the expression goes, so heavenly that we're no use for earthly good. This is the kind of self-denial that strips life of pleasure, all delight, all creation, all joy. The single-mindedness that reduces the world to a grim mission field, a landscape to conquer with an earnest but ultimately loveless zeal. It's a dangerous kind of self-denial that sees ideology before it sees humility and humanity. The kind of sacrifice that encourages people to stay in unhealthy relationships and perpetuate their own victimhood. The kind of devotion that makes the austerity for piety. Surely this is not what Jesus meant either. Certainly I can't resonate with an austerity in Jesus who turned water into wine, or Jesus the advocate for the widow, and the orphan, and the prisoner, and the outcast. So what exactly does it mean to deny oneself? Living as we do in a country and in a culture where the Christian faith is dominant, where people are not killed or tortured for their faith, how do we deny ourselves so that we can give the gospel to others, so that it might thrive here and now? How shall we save our lives by losing them for the sake of Jesus in the 21st century calendar. Right now, I'm asking myself this question in the context of the rising tensions on the Voice to Parliament referendum. I'm asking in the context of the global climate crisis, catastrophic fires, floods and landslides, rising sea levels, droughts and heat waves. I'm asking this question in the context of police brutality, racial injustice, rank economic inequality. I'm asking this question in the context of 32 armed conflicts raging around the world now as we sit here safe and comfortable in our church building together. So the question becomes, how do I orientate myself amidst these crosses of the world? What will I lose in these times and in these spaces? What do I stand to gain if I deny myself? The uncomfortable reality is that we live in such uh, disabling fear of suffering and death that we become consumed by it mentally, spiritually, physically, each day as we try to keep ourselves from that suffering and from that death. Our culture dictates this response 
We are sold on a daily basis opportunities to deny our mortality through the latest cosmetics. This season's fashion, the bigger, the better house, the faster, the shinier car, Botox and cosmetic surgery for the forever young us. I wonder what Jesus would say to these multi-million dollar industries that tempt us into this thought. What would he say to a culture that glorifies violence but cheapens death? What would he say to a global greed that destroys this planet rather than stewarding it with gentleness, care and with love? What would Jesus say about the individualistic society that we live in that values self over civic responsibilities? What would he say to the fearful hearts as we prioritise self-protection over pr uh, pretty much everything else that is out there that matters in this life? I wonder if Jesus would call us to stop clinging to ourselves uh, to, to save our lives so desperately. I wonder if Jesus would invite us to step out of this cycle of acquisition, denial, and keeping up with the Joneses in order to, uh, for the same, to somehow cheat this death, but rather it robs us of our abundant life with Christ that he came to give us. I wonder if Jesus is calling us to lay down our fears so that we might have life and have it in all its fullness. To willingly set aside our own interests, our own liberty, our own goals and our plans in order for us to prioritise the great commandment that Jesus gives to us, to love God and to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. To take up our cross, as he did, is to stand in the heart of the world's pain, not to take note of the pain as, and suffering as we walk on by, but rather to dwell there, to be in it, in the mess, in the sadness, in the darkness, in the mire. To identify those who are aching and weeping and dying and crying out for help. To insist that our comfort is not worth a bar unless the least and the last and the lonely are there to share in that comfort with us. To take up the cross, to recognise Jesus in every suffering in this world and giving of ourselves, our time and our talents to alleviating that suffering all around us. To accept that even those the culture suggests otherwise, even though the culture suggests otherwise that our time here on earth is finite. To follow up with that courageous acceptance with the question, given my inevitable mortality, how shall I spend this God-given life for good? Shall I hoard it for fear of losing it? Or shall I give it away in the hope that I will receive it once again? Shall I protect myself with apathy or give myself away to experience life with abundance? That Jesus offers to all those who ache and weep and bleed alongside him in the suffering of this world. Shall I, like Peter, push suffering away at all costs and in so doing push Jesus away also? Or shall I accompany the one who I call Saviour down the only road that actually leads to life? Our familiarity with the story of Jesus perhaps means that the strangeness and scandal of his death has faded away with time. However, the reality of God is true, that Jesus died. And not only that God died, a humiliating and unjust death as well. Jesus willingly took the violence, the contempt, the apathy, the arrogance of the world. He chose to stand up. He was the scapegoat, he was the sacrifice who refused to waver in his message of universal love and grace and liberation for all, knowing full well that his message was one that would cost him everything. He declared solidarity for all time with those who are abandoned, oppressed, accused, imprisoned and beaten and mocked and abused. His sacrifice births new life that will replenish this earth. <coughs> He took an instrument of torture and turned it into a place of welcome and hospitality and a communion for all people everywhere. He loved and he cared and he showed grace all the way to the end. 
I think Jesus rebukes Peter in our gospel reading precisely because the temptation that Peter offers is alluring, so deceptive and so insidious. You don't have to do the hard thing. You don't have to take this faith business so seriously. You don't have to give up your own rights, privileges and comforts. You don't have to die. No, no we don't. We don't have to, that's true. There is a spectator version of Christianity out there and many of us will have fallen into that trap over time in our lives. But we can be sure that that is a version of discipleship that Jesus does, did not call us to. Faith on the sidelines isn't safe. It doesn't grant us immunity. Its joy is short-lived and its blessings seem superficial. Those who save their lives will lose them. Those who lose their lives will save them. That's the truth that Jesus brought to us and it's about being all in for Jesus. We have to take it or we have to leave it. Are we all in for the good news that Christ brings? Are we ready to live our lives on the edge? Are we ready to say that I'm yours, Lord? All of me, take every passion, take every skill and use them for your service. Or am I wanting to sit on the sidelines as an observer in this discipleship? Shall we pray? Mighty God, we ask that you continue to go before us. We ask that you challenge us. We ask that you give us hope in the disappointments, in the challenges, in the sadness, in the hardness of life. Lord, we pray that as we continue to seek after you, that you'll give us vision for those around us, for our lives in your service. Lord, we pray that even as we look to you, that we see in your difficult calling, that actually, Lord, you have given us life, that you've given up in abundance. Lord, help us claim that for ourselves. Help us to seek out who you are for us, so that we can be you in this community and this world around us. Amen. We bring in prayers for your world and for our church. We pray for all in places of conflict and hardship, for victims of ethnic and religious hatred, ideological conflict, economic exploitation and environmental disaster. We ourselves participate in hostility we ourselves share in the greed. May we share now with a deep sense of justice in the richness of this earth and live with peacefully and generously with all people. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, for your followers in every land, for the churches of this community, for our minister and the people who worship in this place and all who bring your love to other people. Deliver your church from discord and apathy. May we set aside all that would keep us from you. May we faithfully proclaim your gospel Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community, for our families and friends, for those with whom we work and learn, for those in political and legal authority, for those who are unnoticed and unheard. Deliver us from prejudice and self-interest that we may be a loving and hospitable community. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are in need, for the homeless and the hungry, the rejected and the lonely, for those laid down by anxiety and grief or pain. We pray for the sick, and for those who care for them. We pray ourselves to be sensitive to our own callousness and our own indifference.
that we may have the strength to bear our own problems along with raising the problems of others. With generous hearts, may we share in the joy and the sorrow with those who are under unbearable pressure. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this point in the worship, we will ask Stephen to read us his bookmark. A faithful father. A father builds relationships that last throughout the years. He takes the time to listen and helps calm our fears. The father keeps his faith in us, Saviour up above, and his children find refuge in the home he fills with love. We pray for fathers and for all who fulfil fatherly responsibilities. And we call you Father. So we pray that your example of sacrifice and care for us will be an inspiration to all who are responsible to support people under their care. For those in families, for those in their communities, may all fathers find wisdom and strength gentleness and warmth, insight and patience. May families be secure and accepting of those around them. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give thanks for the lives of your faithful people, for all who followed you faithfully throughout their life. They've inspired us. They've set examples. So may we, with your disciples of every age, take up our cross and follow the example that you have set for us. May we be prepared to give no less than all that we have in your service for others. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. We sang Eat This Bread, which was it's a lovely chorus, but the, the verses are somewhat challenging in the fact that each verse is a different tune. <laughs> so um, we're going to sing that today, but we're going to, as a congregation, sing the chorus, and our friends here are going to sing the verses for us. So remain seated, and as we prepare our hearts, we can
Christ's name, let us share in his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. The table of bread and wine is now ready. In this table of company with Jesus and with all those who love him. Beloved God, you have spread before us a table of plenty and give us the cup of new life to drink. Receive all we offer this day, our grateful thanks and praise. Amen. The Lord is here. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it is right to give thanks and praise. O oh God, out of chaos and darkness, you have created life and abundance of life. From the depths of winter, the new life of spring, and the warmth of summer, you have brought forth the harvest of bounty. Your word, your world is indeed good. Through your Son, who lived and toiled and wept and laughed among us, you were one with us in human flesh. You sent your spirit to bring new life to tired bones and souls, causing living waters to spring up from dry places, thirsty places, and putting a new song on our lips. So together we join with all the people on earth and the company of the heavens as we sing it to you a hymn of unending praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honour to you, God of life, for these gifts of Jesus our Lord. Christ is the first fruits of your creation, with you before time, bringing all to completion through his death on the cross. By your power you raised him. Evil can neither overcome or never overcome your love. You set us free to be your body, serving you in this world. On the night before <clears throat> he died, knowing that his time had come, whilst he was at supper with his friends, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We do now what Christ has taught us. We remember his death and his resurrection and we look forward to the day when we will be complete in him. We offer ourselves and all that we are, our gifts and our talents, our strengths and our weaknesses to the glory and honour of your name. Christ is the bread of life. <laughs> Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and on this wine and bless them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest on us too, converting us from patterns of this world until we become more like Jesus, whose food we now share. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, we so now pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The living bread of life is broken for the life of the world. Lord, unite us in this sign. This is the table of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and those of you who have little. Come not because it is I who invite you, but because it is an invitation of the Lord. It is his will that those who want to should meet here in this place. 
the blood of Christ will keep us in eternal life. Shall we pray? Lord God, in deep gratitude for this moment, for this meal, for these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people, because we have shared in the living bread and cannot remain the same. Enable us to be all that you call us to be, <coughs> so that many will be encouraged through us. Lord, may we live to your glory now and forever. Amen. As we go out into this world, let us sing this beautiful reminder of the unmerited love that God has for us, never ending towards all of his creation.
Jesus has called you and placed his trust in you. Go into this world bearing the words of hope and healing. Reach out to others in compassion, for it is Jesus' name that you are sent out to serve. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.